Be on it. <laughs> Hope you like my flyers, sir. Oh, yeah, there was pressure. That last one that y'all put out, like, oh, oh, she just took my bio and then mixed it into the graphics. Like, y'all, you good. You damn good. You're doing a good job. Yeah, okay. man. She keeps me on point. I kid you not. She keeps me on point. If it wasn't for her, I'd have my last five uh, notary war rooms would not be recorded. <laughs> That's why it's so important to have a strong team. Wow, everybody tuning in now. We got quite a few more people on here. Um, Appreciate you tapping so, in, Carletta. Yeah, uh, thank you, Bree. Thank you. Salute to you. Um, I have a very special guest tonight um, or this afternoon. David Bellard, he is one fourth of the Black Wolf Renaissance podcast. The name is self explanatory, ladies and gentlemen. Black Wealth. Renaissance. I I truly believe that we are going through the new renaissance of uh, Black in entrepreneurship. Um, we're making wealth cool again, um, and not only in the aspect of, hey, look, I'm a drug dealer. I got all this fancy clothes, fly clothes, but we're showing people with business credit. We're showing people about how to automate their notary business. We're showing people about insurance, uh, how they should have insurance in their business. So we're sharing more than just a notary. After a while, shit, man, how many documents can I show you how to notarize? We need to expand these empires, man. We need to build our kingdom. And I am very, very happy to have my very, very special guest who I'd like to call a friend, David Bellard. David, introduce yourself, my brother. Yo, yo, yo. Thank you so much, Tiger, for having me on, my brother. It's Great to be here. Glad to be here. Um, as you were saying, David Bellard, one fourth of the Black Wolf Renaissance. Uh, just a country boy, if I have to say my like at the very root of everything. So, uh, I'm one fourth of the Black Wolf Renaissance. I am a rental car business owner, social media entrepreneur. I do digital marketing. I help people find digital marketing solutions on social media. Um, help grow Black Wolf Renaissance from zero to I think we're at 465,000 followers mm. uh, in right over a couple years. Um, help build a top 100 Apple business podcast with my crew. Uh, what else do I do? What else do I do? Um, really passionate about finances. I call myself a financial literacy advocate, working more now toward being a person who can provide financial solutions to people uh, as a financial planner. Um, and in a nutshell, I'm just a brother that really wants to help. That's always been it. Uh, we, everything started for us when we kind of, I, I did the same thing everybody else did when we were told. Go to school, get a job, and you're going you to be good, right? Well, I went to school, didn't get the job right out of school. I had to go back to school to get a job. And then I was like, okay, well, I'm just working now. And I stumbled across uh, financial literacy as a, as a topic, as a world, as a realm. And I was like, wow, like, this is not information that we're getting told. This is not information that's talked about enough. Like, this is stuff that's very important. I went to school, I often say this, I went to school for 23 years of my life. And I ain't learned shit about taxes. I ain't learned nothing about, uh, like, benefits as an employee and how to manage that or, like, cash flow management budget and we didn't get taught any of this stuff i know a lot about like a lot of stuff that didn't really matter to me but i didn't know this so like seeing that uh just wanted to see how we could make a change like how, what what could we do as just four unknown dudes just trying to help and we started an instagram page we stumbled once we started the instagram page um we stumbled into this space where we realized that it was actually people talking about this, but they weren't being highlighted. Like there wasn't nobody trying to, to carry the torch and talk about all these amazing black people teaching these things and doing these things. So we decided to pick up the torch by ourselves. And that's what Black Wolf Renaissance really started. We started off just with sharing information about financial literacy, um, highlighting different black business owners to show people what are the possibilities, like what can be done whenever you do understand finance and you do understand business. Um, and now we're really more so focusing on just educating people through the podcast, uh, through our courses on different topics. I know we have a social media course dropping real, real soon. 
Uh, we teach people about podcasts. It, so we, we're just continually working and growing to level up. Um, one of the biggest things too, we want to teach our people about business ownership, like how to properly own a business because that's something that once we hopped into it, that's kind of like the beauty of the journey for us. Um, like we hopped into full-fledged business ownership. This was our first full-fledged uh, business attempt. And we are learning along the journey and trying to help teach people along the way that like what it means to be a business owner and like certain things that you need to understand if you want to build a long-term sustainable business. Mm. But that's kind of it in a nutshell. So let me ask you this, like, because this is your first rodeo ride with a, like like the business and you guys are actually knocking it out the park on your first business, bro. Like appreciate it. So oh, let me not say it, let me not say it like that. It's not okay. my first business attempt. Okay. This is the first fully we incorporated it. We have a bank account building business, all that type of stuff. Like we initially started uh two of the other partners, Jared Kelly and myself, my first crack at business was a uh, drop shipping. Like, okay. you know, seeing shit on the internet. Yes. And then I went from drop shipping to Florex to wholesaling, and then I found my way here. <laughs> so let me ask you this, because we can all we can all learn from our past mistakes, our past businesses. I tell people all the time, I started about seven different businesses. They did they didn't do any type of numbers that I'm doing now with when it comes to the notary business. What are some of the biggest uh, learning lessons that you have gotten from doing the business that you have now versus the businesses you had back then? Like, what have you learned throughout that process that we can use? So the biggest thing I've learned in this whole entire process is the importance of systems and operations. Mm. Um, um, like that, that's too much. I see like we fall in that trap so much of trying to do everything yourself. Um, the so are you saying like the everything. lack of systems and operation? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, like just like learning really just like how to, the importance of it, how to create something, like how to really give somebody something and pass it off to them. Uh, other lessons that I learned in this, in this journey, um, a lot of paperwork, uh, learning about like just the different forms and filings and different things that you need to understand. Um, managing people, dealing with people, yeah. uh, leveraging other people's skill sets. That's a skill I'm still learning. Uh, delegation. Yeah. That's another major one. Um, what else? And the power of relationships. I'll say that as well. The power, the of, relationships. power of relationship. I used, to, I used to really think that like with business, it's all just about what can you do? But a lot of times it's more about who do you know and like how, how are you adding value to those people? So that and it's just a reciprocal relationship. Hmm. You know, I, I um, when I one of the things that I had a problem with with my other businesses was I had a a high level of anxiety when it came to delegating and giving responsibility to other people mm -hmm. because I, I had in my mind that I was I'm the only one that I can mean, take care of that. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. and um I did not feel confident enough to um, give that responsibility to somebody else. And I, I, the biggest lesson I learned is that I learned that my leadership skills was shit. I didn't have mm. strong enough leadership skills because if you, one, if you have to have patience to mm -hmm. train someone, to give them the right instructions and give them room to make mistakes, right? Mm, that's the that's big a, part. That's leadership right there. So as I started to learn more and more about leadership, specifically leadership, it became a lot easier for me to delegate and say, hey, this person is supposed to make mistakes. That's how we auto-correct. So I, I salute you on that. So one of the things I wanted to ask you too is that you said that you have grown. You guys have grown your your Instagram audience until almost a half a million in a very very short period of time. If I'm not mistaken, like in like two years, right? Yeah. Now, I, yes, look, 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 ladies and gentlemen, you guys know I keep it a hundred, a hundred grand in the hand. I paid for some subscribers. God damn it. 
I said, the hell with this shit. Why do I have to keep trying to build my audience organically? Uh, this guy over here, he said, if I gave him $20, he'll get me 2,000 followers and shit. <laughs> Some dude randomly DM'd you and hit you with that. <laughs> Yo, I paid the dude $20. Yo, my Instagram shit just went. I was like, yeah. Who got the following now, baby? Who's popular in the house? Three weeks yeah. later, my shit went. Yeah, <laughs> man. Damn bots, bro. Damn bots. So what kind bro. of advice would yeah, you give? I, I wouldn't suggest buying followers. That, nah, that, that's, nah, nah. That's, <laughs> that's my experience. I bought followers in the beginning. It, it looked good for a very short period of time. And then I lost all of my followers. Now everything is organic. But, it, you know, my numbers are nowhere near what you guys have. What tips can you give people on how to grow their social media presence? Mm, okay. So growing your social media presence, I think the biggest mistake people make too often is, like, not keeping it people-centric. It's really easy to get caught up in the numbers. Um, like, you want those numbers. And, like, I, to your point about buying followers, it's a shortcut, it seems like. You just want those numbers to, to get, like, the eyeballs. But you need to make sure that you're not just focusing on the numbers. You need to focus on the people. Like, how are you actually adding value and helping to people so you can build a sense of community? Um, and that comes from actually talking to people, actually responding to people, actually having, like, conversations with different members of your audience uh, so that they can actually have a connection and a tie to you and they know that you're providing information. When we very first started BWR, like, I didn't care what anybody DM'd us. It could be a question I ain't had an answer to. Like, I'm going to respond at the very least. And if I don't have an answer, I'm going to let you know I don't have an answer. But I, look, here are some resources that I found that may be able to answer it for you. So I think that's enough, That's one of the big things is like keeping it very people-centric. Um, now, when it comes to just growing and scaling, I think everybody needs a plan before you do anything. Okay. Like, if you're going to create a social media account and you're looking to grow, uh, you need to have an idea of what type of content you're trying to put out. Um, so I'd say, like, before you start anything, look at four to five of the biggest pages that you see, like, people that are in your, your niche, your area, whatever it is, and see what they're doing. See how people respond to the things they do. See what type of hashtags and things they're using. All these things, they play into your social media plan. So like I said, study four to five of them. Take note of the types of contents that perform well. Um, was it a, tweets? Was it infographics? Was it videos of them talking? Was it uh, like just a quote post? Was it memes? Like just pay attention to what people are really, really, re <laughs> I see somebody say uh, so a lot of know you're supposed cheesy ass memes do I have to start doing that <laughs> if the cheesy ass memes is getting leads yes you need to start doing it that's that's the point it's about what works so first you need to identify what's working for other people right then after you identify what's working for other people you need to look at it and see what you're comfortable with doing and how can you take what they're doing and make it your own because you don't want to just be a copycat of everybody else. You want to be able to take like inspiration and motivation from their stuff, but pitch it in your own way. Target audience, not their audience. You're trying to build up your audience. So definitely looking at that, those two, those types of content. Um, and then once you do that, you create a plan. I say, uh, Come up with a plan to post if you really scale fast at the minimum three times a day. Uh, you're going to post three times a day mm -hmm. and you're going to use hashtags on every one of those posts. You're going to come up with three different sets of hashtags related to your target audience based on those big swaps of hashtags that these big pay, bigger pages use. Um, you don't have to come up with your own, whole own set. If you see a, a page that go crazy, uh, this is a little pro tip. If you want to see how well they're performing in hashtags, go into their post and start clicking under the hashtag and look to see if you're seeing their post in there. If you're seeing their post in there, that means that's a good hashtag. It has good discoverability. So that, that means like you might want to use that one. Start using those things 
get like two to three sets. You don't have to use all 30 hashtags. I say 20 to 30 hashtags, plan to post three posts a day at the minimum and pay attention and listen to feedback from the audience. Um, look at how much, what people are sharing, what people are saving, what people are commenting on. What are they talking about? How are you creating a conversation? What conversations are being created around the content you're talking about? So that you can really continue to, to level up within your audience. Because one of the biggest things you want to do, especially when it comes to growing organically, you want your audience to share your content. Mm -hmm. That's how BWR was really able to grow fast. We had a lot of people sharing our content. And this is just another little um, hack with it. Uh, get in with those same people that you kind of study. Uh, people in your niche, people that are like, like, do do things to where you get noticed by them. Maybe it's reposting their content. Maybe it's creating special content on your page that's highlighting them. Maybe it's taking like like taking a feature or something, just making something on your post to like put you on their radar so that they know that you're a person who's in this space and they may just show love. Whenever you show love and you genuine people show love, that's just one of the biggest things. Like you can't do this alone. Social media is very social. Um, you can post pictures and shit all day, but unless you're getting other people to share your content as well, you're not going to be able to grow your audience. So you can leverage other people's audiences as well. Uh, I'm trying to think of any other things. I got like a whole, a whole roll of next information. Yeah, that's, this, bro, that's solid, man. Yeah, that's a, that, let those me know are some if, um, solid tips. Me and uh, what, what's interesting is this. Um, early this morning, me and my team, we did a, and it's funny, we were talking about this earlier, uh, David. I, we did an 80-20 audit on mm -hmm. our business. And basically, we were basically trying to trim the fat we were actively and proactively trimming the fat in our business and understanding that 80% of the stuff that we were doing wasn't worth shit, right? So one of the things that we realized is that we had over 240 posts that we have designed over the last few months. And we were going to start repurposing those posts, right? Um, and we did the timeline, like in my Rise of the Smart Notary book, I, I shared the timeline on how long the visibility of your posts will last on uh, different uh, social media platforms. Mm -hmm. So Instagram, your posts will last for about 20 hours, right? That but we, right. we slice it in half and say, okay, the post is only gonna last about 10 hours. So we put a little pressure on ourselves, right? So meaning if going back to what you just said, if you're posting three to five times a day on Instagram, you actually have enough posts to, to cover a 24 hour period, right? Yes, sir. So yeah. now you look at Facebook, the visibility of your posts lasting on Facebook is about five hours. So with that being said, cut that in half. I always want to cut it in half. I want to put that pressure. Put that pressure you do it at head. two and a half hours, right? So two and a half hours, that means we have to re be releasing a post every, you know, two, three hours to cover that 24 hour span. What that does is once you calculate your post, let's just say you on a minimum side, right? On a minimum side, let's look at this. You put two posts a day, on IG, um, what does that come up to? Seven days a week. Seven days a week, you'll have fourteen posts. Fourteen posts covering two hundred and I mean twenty-four hours. You have now solidified or locked in a spot to be visible for two hundred and eighty hours a week. Mm -hmm. You feel me? And I want to speak to that more just because like what you mentioned, uh, like with these these visibility windows, it's kind of speaking to the algorithm yes. and how that's, that kind of works. So like the biggest reason why you need to post so frequently is because the way these algorithms are set up, you're not getting exposure to your entire audience, especially on a platform like Instagram or Facebook. Um, they're only showing your, your post to a small portion of your audience. 
I want to say, I mean, this was maybe a year or two ago. Um, they may have changed it just a tad bit now, but the way it typically works is they only show your post to 10% of your audience mm -hmm. um, in the first 30 minutes to an hour. Mm -hmm. And based on their reaction to it, is how they determine if they're going to continue to push it out. So that's why it's important, like how Tiger's mentioned, to have that visibility because if you're not posting and people aren't engaging with it, you're not going to be on people's timeline. Like the way algorithms work, y'all know it, y'all see it on y'all own stuff. The things you like the most are the things that appear the most often. So you're vying for these people's attention. You need to be putting out content that they want to see in order to continue to get in front of these people. Like, and that's why you need to throw so much at the wall. And with BWR, at one point we were posting like eight or nine times a day, just because we understood the space we were in. Like we're one of the central social media pages for this. So we need to be putting out content all day because we got 460,000 followers. On average, maybe I say like 80 or 90,000 people are actually seeing a post. You need to put out content, especially, and you need to be trying to hit people at different times as well, because not everybody's on social media at the same time. True. I might be a person that gets on early in the morning. Tiger might be somebody that gets on late at night. Whatever times you hit, you just want to make sure that like you're getting it out there because it's, I, I'm trying to remember the, the factors. I know it's relevancy is the number one factor. Like, um, is this something that's going on currently? Uh, timing, like, is this something? The most, re the more recent you post it, whenever somebody opens the app, the earlier they'll show it. Um, and it was a third factor. Dang, it. don't, don't. I'm gonna get back to it. Don't worry about mm -hmm. it. But yeah, it's a few factors that they play into this whole algorithm thing. Interesting, man. So I hope you guys are getting value from this. Like he's dropping gems. He's telling you guys how he him and his team were able to grow his podcast channel, which was, I think you guys hit, if I'm not mistaken, top 10 in uh, podcasts in Apple and Apple uh, uh, podcasts. Yeah, yeah, we, we, we peaked at number 23. We right. peaked all the way up at 23 at one time. That was an amazing run. Uh, on average, we rank up at like 100, like we're in the hundreds. Like you'll float around like 100, either plus 20, minus 20. Like we'll be in the 80s, the hundreds, and every now and again we'll make a push. It just depends. Yeah, yeah. Let uh, while we're while we're still on, let's beat up uh, social media up a little bit more. So let me ask you: When it comes to the post, I'm sure there's a few people on here that think, "Oh man, I ain't got time to be posting, putting posts on social media all day like that." Man, I'm too busy. I'm I'm ripping and running. I'm doing all of these things. Do you guys have an automated system where you have posts being released or are you guys manually uh, putting it out yourself right now? Oh, no, my brother, we got apps for that. <laughs> I already knew, yeah, I, just had to, I had to put it out there because like, you know, people will be like, hey, you know, uh, you know what's crazy though? You, I think about a year or two years ago, I used to hear more about apps like Hootsuite, Buffer. Who's that? This I can't Planoli. Say what is it? This is the app we use. It's called Planoli. This is our content for the rest of the week. We got it all laid out already. Bro, we, we need to put that in there. Bree, if you could type that in uh, the chat section. You said Chernobyl? I, I got it. I'll drop it in the chat. Okay, yeah. Planoli. Yeah, so because... Here's another one. It's later. Ah. See, I never heard of those. I, got, I, I use a few of them. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. These, so like Tiger was saying, it is kind of time consuming to sit here and think about social media posts all day and sit here and think about, oh, man, I got to post this, I got to post that. That was a mistake we definitely made at first. We were sitting here having to manually post everything, and it kind of it takes a lot of your time. So what we had to do is find softwares that do this. Um, they used to have one I loved, man. It's called App High. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. But they was doing some stuff where Instagram wouldn't let and go down. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of these scheduling apps, they're cool if you just have single frame posts um, and like 60 second videos. But they okay. can't auto post um, 
anything other than those. So like if you have a carousel post where it's multiple slides, you're gonna, you can put them in these softwares, you can plan your content out, but when it comes time to post it, they're going to, um, they're gonna send you a push notification on your phone. Oh, and when you get okay. a push notification, you're gonna just like, the content's gonna, you press it, the content appears on Instagram, you gotta manually post it, but- Yeah, you might as well do it manually. But it is, it's still, it's like, it, it's kind of a catch-22 with it. Cause it's like, you could just put it as a draft in Instagram for the same thing. Oh shit, my computer finna die. Um, you could just put it as a draft, but it is kind of convenient if you had like a specific time that you were thinking about and maybe you would have forgotten if you didn't. Uh, it gives you a push notification to kind of help you. But um, yeah, these apps, they're, they're really convenient for that reason though. Like Absolutely. At the least, you don't, you don't like, have to sit here and think about content all day, it just gets posted. Yeah, because in, in our organization, we use Buffer, right? So mm -hmm. Buffer, at first I used to use Hootsuite. I got off the Hootsuite and went over to Buffer and then that's how we send all of our um, our posts. So like a lot of the posts that you see on social media, Brie has pre-populated everything almost for the whole month. We might send some individual broadcasts in between, but we're not physically, manually putting these posts out. We have it scheduled to release one in the day, one in the afternoon, one in the evening, just like you said, like some people wake up at night. We want to increase it like you said, um, like ideally it would be like seven to nine times a day, right? Um, but we're just gauging it off of the visibility time that one of the posts is going to be, uh, the post is gonna be visible to an audience. Nine thing, like I feel like at a point it was a bit overkill. Um, mm -hmm. Like the three to four, I think it is kind of a sweet spot. So it's not it's not a bad thing. It's it's just kind of really looking at what your audience reacts to the most. Like what's and I would say I reaction. would say it also depends on which platform you are. So if you like yeah. you were on Twitter, like you know your tweet is only going to last about like what a minute, if that, because it's a it's a waterfall on Twitter. So you mm -hmm. put your tweet and then it just gets pushed down, pushed down, pushed down, pushed down, pushed down. So you'll have to be a little more frequent if you really want to capture their attention on Twitter. So, you know, I guess it depends on like, okay, I'll give you an example. Um, Pinterest, for those that you mm -hmm. want to use Pinterest, your post stays on Pinterest for like a, a few days. Yeah, Pinterest has great searchability too. <laughs> yeah, like, you know, like I one post will last a like few days. So that the the longevity of your visibility on Pinterest is much, much longer than uh, Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. Love it, man. Um, yes, so the next thing I wanted to talk to you about, because you are in the financial space, like you were saying that you're getting into the insurance side of things. I know we have a notary on here that also have their series nine, their insurance as well. Um, as these notaries start making more and more money, like, you know, they're on this notary war room, they're learning new ways of optimizing their time, maximizing their time, they're, the income is coming in. What are some mm -hmm. of the vehicles you would um, suggest that notaries start looking into on how to put their money to work for them instead of them working for the damn money all the time? I got you. I got you. So, well, first and foremost, as a notary, as you grow on the scale of your business, your first priority should continue to be like seeing, making sure before you do anything with the money, like making sure your business is straight, um, making sure that you have enough money to operate and continue to grow, scale, do your marketing and all that. But then like when it comes just to your take home profit, uh, you shouldn't look at that money as just money that you now have to spend, right? You should look at this as money that you can use to invest, money that you can use to place in different places to take care of your life. Now, as a notary, most of y'all, y'all are technically, you start your own business, you're a self-employed individual. Um, you you don't have like the same things as a, a person with a job where like, you know, you got your benefits and you get all that. Now you can get that set up, but you would need to go ahead and 
change your business over from like a sole proprietorship to S Corp and all that. But before any of that, I think the first thing you could do is set up an account. Like I think too many of us, we overlook the idea of saving for the future. Uh, Roth IRA is an amazing, amazing vehicle that anybody can set up. You don't need to, it's not like a 401k where you got you no know, company matching under that. Roth IRA is just a simple retirement account. You set it up yourself and go to any brokerage, you can go ally anybody. And you can fund it up to $6,000 a year. If you're under 55, over 55, you can fund it 6,500 a year. Um, and that could be tax-free growth. So because you paid yourself out of your own money for your business, uh, that money is then put into that vehicle. And over the next 10, 15, 20 years, whatever you need, you can use that money, grow that money. And then the Roth IRA, one thing I love about it is that it's a very flexible vehicle. So you can use it for a lot of different things. Like it doesn't just have to be for retirement. If need be, you can pull some of that capital out, uh, like whatever capital contributions you made to it, you can pull that out if you need a down payment for a house. You can pull that out if you need tuition assistance for your kids and that's all tax free still. Like it's a lot of different ways you can leverage that type of vehicle. Um, outside of that, you you do need health insurance for this, but I also recommend an HSA account. I think that's one of the ones we don't look over. We don't. What, look what kind of account is it? Uh, it's a HSA health savings account. Okay. So a health savings account uh, is primarily designed for people who have health insurance, but they have a real high deductible um, on the health insurance plan. And it's made so that you can put some pre-tax dollars away uh, and have something set off to the side that you can use to pay for medical expenses, qualify medical expenses. So you go to the doctor, you never know if anything happens. And with the HSA, it's like while the primary use is for um, medical expenses, one of the beauties of it is that it rolls over continually. So whatever money you put in, it can continue to grow. And you can take that same money, put it in like a sub account in that HSA profile and uh, invest that money as well. So like you can have money growing in your HSA while you also use it for those qualified expenses and things of that nature. So like, that's another one. Um, yeah, outside of that, I say insurance. Like everybody needs insurance. Uh, having a good insurance policy, like term policy is cool, but I mean, Tiger was speaking about this beforehand. Like if you really bring it in bread, uh, a whole life policy is something to look into and not just like a regular whole life, get something like a variable whole life or indexed uh, life insurance policy where you're putting money in and it continues to grow so that whatever you put in, like you, that money in a life insurance policy is gonna be guaranteed upon your death, right? Everybody just looks at life insurance as just death. But these things, you can you can have growth in these accounts and you can use this later in life just in case you need to access it for an investment. And me and Ty was talking about this prior to like the whole infinite banking concept yes. where you basically, you own a whole life policy and you're, you're able to play the bank because you have funds. You can loan those funds out to other individuals. You can borrow it from yourself versus having to go to the bank. And whenever you're paying back into this, you're paying back yourself because at the end of it all, when you pass away, the death benefit doesn't change. Now, if you don't pay everything back, obviously, uh, if you borrow it against you, you don't pay everything back, whatever you, the difference is they subtract that from your death benefit, but the beneficiaries can still benefit from that. And that's uh, that's another really good one that I think we don't look at too often. We always yeah. hear people talk about, about don't buy, hold, just get term and invest the difference uh, in like a brokerage or stock, but I always like to counter with the point that while it's, yeah, you will get greater returns in the stock market, you're also exposed to more risk and you need to be aware of that. Like we all seen what happened last March. We don't know what's going to happen five, six years. Out. We don't know five, six months down the line what's going to happen. So having a vehicle where your money is protected, you're guaranteed a rate of return. It's always something to look into to manage your risk. Yeah, shout out, man. Hey, I hope you guys are getting this. Like the, the notary war room is more than just learning about notaries. We're showing and teaching you guys 
how to build a kingdom, your own kingdom here. The more kingdoms we have out there, the better we're going to be when, when the shit hits the fan for any type of reason. And we'll have other people within our organization, within our network to lean on to find out, hey, what's going, what's going on on this section over here? What's going on over here? We were chopping it up about the insurance side. I was telling David that I'm looking into getting to private banking. So I want to be in a position where I can actually uh, be a lender to uh, people and maybe in some real estate and maybe in their business. And an insurance vehicle is a really, really good way for me to be able to do that. So, you know, take, take this information, man. You know, if it suits you for where you are right now in life, pull the trigger. If that's something that you wanna, you know, explore later down the line, write it down in your journal and then start going after that, you know, slowly but surely, because you're going to get there. And I don't want you to get confused once all of this, some, there, we have notaries on here that are making like ten, twelve thousand $12,000 a month. You know what I mean? They're, they're out there mm -hmm. ripping and running. Like, what are you doing with all of that money that's coming in? You know, there's only so many yeah, cards you're going to buy. Your, your bills are all paid up. What are you doing with that, the funding? You were saying something, yeah. David? Uh, no, yeah, you know I'm saying like you gotta have a plan. Like if you don't have that plan, like how you allocating this money, you're gonna end up losing it. Um, I always like to think about that with budgeting. Like budgeting is giving yourself a plan for your money. If you're making ten thousand dollars a month take home, you don't need to just know that you're making ten thousand dollars a month. You need to know how you allocate that ten thousand dollars as well. Like indeed, what's going where. Because if you go and we got a free budgeting spreadsheet courtesy of BWR, if anybody was interested in that, y'all just say it in the chat. I'll make sure I drop the link to that in here. But like, um, if you don't know where it's going, you're just going to keep spending. And yeah, you might have your bills and all that. You know exactly like what's the non-negotiables, but what about those discretionary things? You need a plan for that too. Because when you don't plan for the discretionary things, that's how you end up blowing your bag on like fun things that you just did on a whim because you didn't have a plan right uh, like it's all about identifying first with your priorities seeing like okay this is what i'm trying to do like what what am i you got kids you got you just by yourself like what's your goal what's your ultimate goal with this money because just having money to have money that's pointless like you're not getting anything done like we was chopping it up earlier about the PPP loan that's going out there right now, right? And um, shout out to my 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 home girl uh, Renee Renee Dentman out there in California. Like, she's a corporate accountant, um, and she 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 be chewing me out, yo. She be she just like you gotta have your paperwork in order, right? You gotta like I be feel I be feeling this small by the time we get off the phone conversation. But she's so right because we're missing out on a lot of opportunities, a lot of allocated Thanks. funds that are being distributed right now with PPP loans, with these IEDLs and you know grant money. And we're unable to tap into it because our bookkeeping isn't right. Thanks. Our accounting isn't in order and we can't take advantage of this bread. Big, big facts, man. Big facts. Uh, my girl, Miss Business, high CPA, she had said the same thing. Like, it's so many business owners that's missing out on this paper because they didn't have their taxes together or they didn't file the right forms. You just got to have your, your P's and Q's together. That bookkeeping piece is major. You can really pay people like 50, 60 bucks a month to keep your books for you. Because we all know, like Tiny, you know it as well. That's just annoying. You don't want to sit there annoying and, shit. and go going through your damn transactions like, oh, I spent this much money on this and this money. Nobody wants to do that shit. Pay somebody. Yeah. If you, especially if you bring in money, that's an investment in your business to make sure that you can take advantage of these funds. And uh I know you were mentioning the PPP. Um just for people that are like unfamiliar with it, that's the paycheck protection program, that's the government. Um response to the coronavirus for business owners that lost revenue or they were affected by the virus in some way, shape or form. They're offering uh, forgivable loans for those small businesses, people with fewer than 500 employees who are able to 
prove that they lost their income or they were affected negatively by the, uh, the pandemic. So in order to get these loans, you got to go through the SBA, find a lender. They got hella forms and stuff you got to fill out. I, I'm not going to get into the particulars of all that because, I mean, that's a, that's a whole podcast in itself, to be honest. Yeah. But the gist of it is you use the money to, you can get the loan forgiven if you use the money to pay for expenses for your employees. Like 60% of the money got to go toward paying employees or payroll. This is if you have employees. If you buy yourself, I'm not exactly sure what the rule is on it. I just know that if you pay yourself, it's all based on your net income. And then they multiply that by two, uh, two and a half percent. But you got employees, you got to pay uh, 60% of that out to them and make sure everything on qualified expenses. And like, you can get the loan forgiven after, I think it's, it's you have to disperse the money Mm -hmm. between eight and 24 weeks. So that means you got to use all the money that they sent out between eight eight weeks and 24 weeks. So what that is like, what that is in terms of months. That's like two months six. to yeah. six months, two to six months. Mm -hmm. Got to use the funds. Um, and yeah, it just, it just keep going up from there. Like right now, uh, the PPP is still available for anybody who hadn't done it yet. Uh, you can go, if you're a first time person, you can apply. Uh, if you, the second time, I think you have to be able to show that you had a 25% loss in your mm. business, like a reduction in income over uh, like year to year, quarter to quarter. So like if you look, you show Q1 2019 and Q1 2020, you gotta be able to show that there was a reduction in your, your income. Yeah. Um, being able to prove that and yeah, that's that's kind of the general gist of it. You have any, anybody have any questions specifically related to Yeah, it? let's go into the Q&A section of, of the the notary war room now. So we had a, a tech, shout out to tech out there in East Oakland, California. He says, uh, it's beyond me how notaries don't invest in their estate and trust, but yet they're notarizing a shitload of them, right? Uh, this is a game we stepped in. Yes, uh, every everybody was negatively affected by the pandemic. Well, I, Tech, I, I actually made more money during the pandemic. Yeah, me, me too, my dog. <laughs> I ain't gonna be able to lie to you. Like, I ain't even go. I ain't even gonna hold you, son. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I can't. I can't. Because we tried, man. I one of my CPA, she cold it, she cold with it. I was talking to a lot of people. We was trying to get it, but our business, we seen like during the pandemic, I want to say like our growth was like it was like five hundred percent growth in business. We went from being like, yeah, that's like, crazy. Just getting started to over a six figure business. And they're like, oh well, technically we can't qualify for that PPP. So right, right, yeah. Uh... Yeah, my numbers been going up steadily every every single month. So I can't. I mean, I'd, I'd have to have one of uh, Bernie Madoff work on my papers and shit. <laughs> Yo, Bernie, make, me, make it look like we, we took a loss. Hey, and then man, Bernie will rob me and shit. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, if you have questions, definitely drop them in the chat section. If you guys want to go live, we can go live. You know, just say that you want to go live with us. And we'll definitely help you guys out. So, in the meantime, David, tell people how they can find you, man, and, and what what are you working on in the future here? Okay, okay. So you can find me on uh, social media, Instagram at David the Goliath. The lovely Miss Bree dropped the link in the chat already. So if y'all nice. want to follow me personally, y'all can go ahead and click that. Uh, Black Wolf Renaissance BWR podcast. I also have another page uh, called Black Wolf Movement. Similar concept, similar uh, messaging. Um, all this is about elevating our people, trying to help help them learn more with finances. Uh, as far as what I got going on, uh, personally, this year my goal, I have a rental car business. So my goal with that is to- oh, Okay, wait, 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 wait. We, we're gonna have to add a couple more minutes on to this podcast. I gotta know about this rental car shit, man. I wrote it down on my board. It was like, ask David, about this rental car business. Break that down to me, brother, because that, that sounds like a fun investment. 
So yeah, for sure. I I really I've been enjoying it so far. Um, so the whole gist of the rental car business is there's this platform called Hire Car. You may have heard another one called Turo, um, where you as an individual you get to rent your car out to people, uh, and collect profits. I like I'm personally using Hire Car. Um, it's a platform where people they rent your car for a daily rate. I I think my car is at like forty one bucks. They rent it at a daily rate and they use it to do Uber, Uber Eats, Lyft, that type of stuff. They use it for ride sharing. So they're using your car to make money, basically. That's the gist of it. They use your car to make money and they pay you to use the car. So do they I put out, the gas or you put the gas? Uh, they put the gas. The only thing you worry about with the car is uh, maintenance. So you're just like kind of like the same type of situation as like a landlord and a renter. You know, yeah. uh, I'm responsible for the actual asset here. Like, this is still mine. If anything goes wrong, uh, like mechanical wise, it's still mine to fix or anything. But uh, like, the beauty of it is with Hire Car, they they have they offer insurance through the platform. Uh, Turo does as well. They offer okay. insurance through the platform that covers you in case someone damages your vehicle while they are in it, or that they um, they hurt somebody else or anything. And that policy, or they steal the car, all kinds of things. They got all kinds of craziness that can occur. But you're covered up to a million dollars for property damage. Uh, they replace the car in the case of an accident. So it's, it's beneficial. Um, but the well, gist of the business, you. gist of the business, you get the car, you rent it out to people, and you collect passive income. So what I love about hire cars, because they're using the car to make money, these people, they, they'll keep these cars for a long time. The very first car we put on there, um, BWR as a crew, we got a car together and we put it on there. We bought one for like $9,000. This guy has been in the car now for, I think since October. So it's been over four months he's had the car and he pays every day faithfully, like faithfully. Wow. If he can't pay or like if there's any issues, um, we just text him. Like every time we need to do an oil change or like routine maintenance on the car, we just hit him up. Be like, hey, bro, can you bring us the car so we can do this? He brings us the car. He pays for that day. We call him the next day. He gets the car back. Like it's just beautiful. Dude, and I love today, it. I freaking love it. To date, I, I just want to give people like some numbers too with it. To date with that vehicle, um, I want to say it's made like right over $4,000. They're usually like it'll cash flow with like eight hundred dollars a month, uh, and yeah, like I think it's like right under four thousand dollars is made just off him alone, and we only paid nine thousand for the car. Right. It, is, it hadn't even been a year yet, so like it, it's definitely a play. Um, I went ahead and with my second car, we didn't buy. I didn't buy it outright. I just put a thousand dollars down on it, uh, and I got a little note on it. So basically, I rent it out, and it doesn't cash flow exactly the same. Like I'm not getting the whole 700, 800 in my pocket, but with this second car, I'm still able to collect like three, four hundred off the top every month. Um, just and then that, and it covers your your rent. monthly payment. Oh yeah, yeah, it paid a monthly payment. Like having it rented out for, I think it's ten days a month will cover every all my expenses and stuff. And usually uh, the, these people, like I said, they keep these cars, especially if it's a good car. Yeah. Um, mine, I just had my renter, I think she extended for like three or four days. She's been in it for like a week now for my other car. So definitely a goal of mine this year. I want to expand that business. I'm trying to get at least five of them on the road um, just so I can have like another stream of income. It's, like, it's a really passive business. That's one of my favorite things about it. I, I don't spend a lot of time thinking about it. That's why yeah. I'm like, I really want to expand this because the the most stressful it's been um, mm -hmm. and the most time I've spent on it with my new car, my, my car, I got to tell everybody the good and the bad. I actually had a renter mess my car up mm -hmm. and I didn't file the claim process in time okay. to hire a car. So I ended up having to handle everything myself. And that took me out of the game for a little minute. And I think even then, I didn't spend that much time on it. Like, I had to go drop it off to the shop, get it fixed. I spent more money than I spent time on it, like getting fixed. But 
on a monthly basis, I'd say I probably spend less than five hours on it. It's just five super hours fast. a month running that business that gives yeah, you a positive like, cash flow. Passive, bro, like super passive. And it's building your credit because you're making car, you, you got a car note built. Listen, man. Hey, I put it in the book, bro. I didn't put that part because I wasn't up on that game, but I, I, I explained in the Rise of the Smart Notary book that we live in a shared economy right now. This is the shared economy. You can make money in real estate and not own a piece of property like Airbnb. Now you're showing us how you can make money owning a car and you're not even driving it and you're making money back where other people are actually spending money or losing money every month. You're actually making money off of the vehicle. Oh my God. Turn the ad, uh, turn it up, uh, what they call a, they call a car depreciating asset, but shit, it's, it's making money for me. That's all I feel. Exactly, exactly. Woo, that's phenomenal, man. Uh, Follow David oh. Pillar, y'all. <laughs> this guy <laughs> got game for days. I, we could chop it up all day with this brother, man, because he, on his podcast, he interviews such influential people that drop hella game, right? Yeah, man. So it's hard to not, you know, well, if you're sitting at the footstep of these, these legends that are actually proven and they have skin in the game, not to absorb some of that energy, some of that knowledge, I'd be doing myself a disservice. Yeah. I'd be doing myself a disservice. Just like even from you, my brother, like you put a game in our ears with the, the ghostwriting game. Like I never would have thought like it would be as simple, but just hearing you come in and break it down, it was like, wow, like guys, we really don't have to do all this work ourselves. Like we don't have to sit here and write no book. We can commission to somebody to write the book, tell them what we need and get it done. Yeah. Like sitting there learning from people like yourself and just all the people that we we've been able to interview i've been able to gain a lot of insight and i just appreciate it i'm very thankful for the opportunity honestly well, we're thankful. appreciative of you being on the show ladies and gentlemen thank you for tuning in for the notary war room this is the infamous david bellard thank you so much brother for being on here follow him on ig black wolf renaissance Bree, put that, put, put all the handles back in there for me, please, so they can follow this brother. <laughs> and and he has a lot of things going on. Yeah, check him out, support it. If it looks like something that you want to get into, I'm I'm telling you right now, bro, I will be having some vehicles on this road, man. <laughs> hey man, you you know I ain't nothing but a call away, my brother. You just hit me up, and whatever I can help you, I can just I can just do my thing. Shout Thank you, Carl you, Carlita. I appreciate you. Uh, Matter of fact, you know what? I, I should have done this. I'm going to give shout outs real quick. Um, shout out to Anna Santos. Shout out to you for being on. Ben Brown. Uh, we have Ben Brown in the house. Brandon, Carlita Wilson. Thank you for being on. Desheen Smith. Tech out there in East Oakland, California. Thank you for being on. We really appreciate you guys. Till next time, peace, love, and happiness and cash flow. You heard? Yes, sir. I appreciate y'all. Peace. Peace.